So Dan Olmsted is our New York State IPM Network for Environment and Weather Applications, or NUA coordinator. And today's, today he's going to be talking about the ways that weather affects our gardening, perhaps um, in some ways that we hadn't thought about before. So go ahead, Dan. Hey, great. Thanks a lot. So um, this is a really interesting subject for me, uh, because if we think about weather, you know, it's not just these big weather systems that come through our, our area or our city or region. Um, it's all the ways that trickles down, so to speak, into, you know, maybe we have a little half acre farm or maybe we have a garden in the backyard. So just in the next few minutes, I want to cover some <clears throat> different concepts and ideas and maybe change the way you're thinking about weather in, in your own personal um, growing spaces. So uh, with that, I'll get started. Let's see. Uh, okay. All right. So what I'd like to do first is kind of look at uh, a garden or a small farm in a very holistic sense. So when we talk about weather, we're really not talking about the weather itself. We're talking about how weather impacts what we're trying to do. And when we're trying to grow plants, um, I see it kind of as this trifecta, or um, I have on the screen uh, what's called a Venn diagram, where things are overlaid, so they all have interactions and whatnot. So we have weather, but we also have, um, if we're talking about rain, for example, what happens to that water when it goes into the soil, but then we also have what um, happens and how the plants interact with that water, how they're able to get it. So for today, what I'm going to focus on um, is this blue circle and within that actually what is called microclimate. Now you might have heard this term thrown around before, um, but for today's talk, what I'm talking about is, you know, within a few feet, like within maybe a 10 square foot area or 50 square foot area, what is happening with the airflow and rainfall and, you know, why are my plants wilting or why are my plants doing really well? Um, so just to provide a little framework uh, for the next few slides. So to start right off the back, I'm going to uh, step way back. And so if you think back to earth science in middle school, um, you probably weren't about the water cycle. Uh, one of the really interesting things about the water cycle uh, at the regional or even continental scale is that you have these large physical features that can have uh, very strong effects on uh, a thunderstorm and the precipitation that comes out of that thunderstorm, for example. So in this diagram, you know, if you think about the Pacific Northwest or even um, uh, here on the East Coast in the Allegheny Mountains or Appalachia, you know, you've got these large land masses where a system comes through and on one side of a mountain, it's gonna be really lush and green. And within a few miles on the other side, you might even have drought conditions or very, much less water. Um, and so you've got moist rising air, you've got dry descending air, and um, you'll see the connections I'm gonna make in just a minute here. So to give you an example of this, if any of you uh, have seen aerial photographs of Hawaii, it's, it's a very, very strong effect. Um, so on the eastern side of this particular island, you see is lush rainforest, and on the western side, it's almost desert-like with very little water. Now, I want to bring this a little more local. So this is Canandaigua, New York, here in the Finger Lakes. Um, and I have a really high-level uh, high view out of uh, Google Earth of, of the city and the town. And you can see that there's a lot of features in here. So down at the bottom, you've got Canandaigua Lake. But over on the left-hand side, which is the west side of town, uh, we actually have some hills that start to come up, uh, maybe some flat areas. And maybe you see a little bit of forested areas and some, some urban development there. Um, and I have this yellow rectangle highlighted because we're going to start to zoom in as I talk about this. So just keep in mind what you're seeing in this picture as I go on to the next one. So now if we start to zoom into that specific area, you start to have an awareness of other things that begin to affect uh, airflow, for example. Um, you know, some houses are out in the open. Uh, you know, there's large open lawn areas, whereas other places have a uh, forested backyard. So the point I want to make is that all of these things start to influence what happens when we do have a rainstorm or, you know, we have a really high humidity day in the summer uh, or in the evening uh, in the fall, for example. So if we keep going in this direction, if we zoom in even further, 
we start to see that it's not just the natural features. It's not just the trees or the topography. There's actually human uh, structures at play here. So uh, that circle in the middle, there is a fenced in backyard. So if I have a garden back there, you can imagine that airflow is gonna be reduced. And so that's gonna have an impact. Now, whether that's positive or negative remains to be seen. But you know, these other two areas I've circled, um, the one in the lower left, you can see it's shaded. So if I were to be um, putting in beds towards that area, I've got to be aware of how much sunlight is being um, is available to those crops. And then in the upper le left corner is just one more example. So you got a lot of paved area. Um, so these things all influence what happens in in what I'm calling our microclimate growing systems. You know, at a small scale. So. Considering all these factors, so we have that high level view, um, we have maybe the lands, what I'll call landscape scale, and then I'll have what I'm calling back backyard scale. There's really three things uh, that we should be considering when we're trying to grow things. So number one, how much rain did I get? So that big thunderstorm that affected the whole city, um, you know, dropped some amount of rain. But then what happens to that water when it gets into the soil? You know, what kind of soil do I have? How available is that? Um, and so on and so forth. And what I wanna point out in this slide is uh, just what I was getting at. So I just have a radar image of, uh, you know, what we call a mesoscale weather system. This might cross a region or several states and maybe it brings a lot of water. So, oh yeah, there's rain in the forecast. We're gonna get a lot of water, but it can't really stop there because there's additional questions we need to ask as home gardeners or urban, urban growers and whatnot. Um, how much rain we got is important, but what happens to that in our soils is equally important. And so you can see we're starting to tie all these things together. So it's not just about the weather, it's about our whole system. Um, you know, some people have a very low tech approach to understanding soil moisture. So you could do a squeeze test, for example. Other people will have a manual rain gauge. Others, you know, maybe you have the resources to put out some sort of weather station. Like these are all different ways to get at the same sort of information. It's just a matter of how accurate um, and precise you wanna be uh, when you're making those decisions. And so uh, next few slides, this is gonna be a little bit interactive. I'm just gonna ask you some questions that maybe we can put in answers in the chat, but I have two pictures here. One is a, a clay soil on the left side and the other is a very sandy soil on the right-hand side. So just look at those for a minute and you know, have those in your mind as I bring up the next slide, because I'm going to ask you a question. Okay, so the first question I want to ask is not graded, obviously, is which type, which soil type holds more water? Is it a cubic foot of sandy soil, or is it a cubic foot of clay soil? Uh, I'm going to guess that we have uh, a mix of people with experience, so some folks will get it, others won't. Let me just open up my chat so I can see what people are saying. A, B, A, clay. All right, so we're getting a mix. Um, so the answer is that when we look at volumetric water content, um, clay soil actually is gonna hold more. And I'll explain why. That may not make much sense because if you think of a sandy soil, you're gonna say to yourself, well, but that has a lot of water after it rains. A lot of water comes out of that. Um, there we go, okay. Um, so what I have here is a diagram. So on the left-hand side is what we'll call like a microscopic view of sandy soil. And then on the right-hand side is microscopic view of clay soil. So we have, when you, when you think about water in your soil profile, it's not just sitting there. So the, the light blue color would be what we call um, gravitational water. And that would be like when your soil is saturated. So it can only hold so much. Like that goes away right away uh, after a rainstorm. But then you'll see we've got this thicker band of a darker blue color. So that represents um, capillary water. So there's actually like this physical interaction going on with the soil particles that allows it to somewhat hold on uh, to that water. And then um, the last the last layer there, that inner circle, represents um, the type of soil that, or the type of water that holds on really, really tight. And so, while sandy soil might have a higher level of, of 
that gravitational water that maybe goes away quickly, like that's what we can see with our eyes after a rainstorm, clay soil actually, if you look at the physical interactions, is going to hold a lot more water and it's going to hold on to it more tightly. So that, that leads into the second question. So which has more available water? We're not talking about, you know, there's a liter of water in that soil somehow. Uh, now we're talking about um, how, how does a plant interact with the water that's in the soil? Is it easier for it to get water out of sandy soil or is it easier to get water out of clay soil? Uh, so go ahead and maybe a couple people just put that in the chat. So the answer is that the sandy soil is gonna have more available water for reasons I was just describing. So I just gotta, there we go. Um, because the clay soil is gonna hold on so tightly to that water that you know if you're out in a cornfield and you, you can see that the clay soil has moisture in it, but it is holding onto it so tightly that our plants cannot access it. So it's just, it's one, it's, it's something to consider when we're talking about weather in our, in our gardens and in our um, small farm settings that, you know, it's not just about the amount of rain that falls, it's about how much is available and then how much uh, the plants can get. So um, we won't go to, into too much detail today, but these basic principles uh, lead to a really interesting and complex interaction between soil, like the types of materials that are in a soil um, and that plant, uh, the plant available water that's in there. So this is something that if you're interested in, uh, you can look it up online. This is just called a soil texture pyramid. Um, and depending on the amounts of clay, silt, and sand, you're going to get different water holding capacities. So, uh, and again, I'm not sure how I'm doing it on time, but uh, I just want to kind of uh, reiterate the fact that uh, you have to be able to interpret your water availability. So when you hear the weather report and hear that you have an inch of rain, um, you need to take it a few steps further because that's not going to really um, be as helpful as taking this three-step approach. So step one, how much rain did you get in your backyard microclimate? Number two, how much water is in your garden soil? And then how much of that water is available to uh, the plants with your soil type? And so just to circle back to microclimates, um, you should also be looking at, you know, what, what those physical structures are in your backyard or in your growing setting that maybe prevents airflow. So maybe water evaporates more slowly from the soil. Uh, if you're planting right next to a fence, maybe you're going to get a shadow during the day or even like a little bit of a rain shadow if you, if you um, have a windy storm come through and things like that. So um, I think uh, if you're interested in getting more information about this sort of stuff, you can reach out to uh, your Cornell Cooperative Extension collaborators, uh, as well as Master Gardener programs. Um, and you can also reach out to us here at the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program. One final thing I am going to um, close out by saying is that, you know, for a very long time, uh, we have, we've done this sort of work on, at uh, at the farm level. So uh, we have this network that Amara mentioned, the uh, NUA, the Network for Environment and Weather Applications. But moving forward, um, we're going to continue to support that, but we also want to start expanding the availability of our resources to support the small growers, to support the backyard gardeners. Um, and that means a lot of different things in different ways. Uh, you know, this needs to be accessible. Um, weather stations can be expensive. So we're trying to look for ways to get around that um, and to understand really what these needs are uh, in this new type of, of setting um, so that we can start to bring more data uh, and some more informed um, decision-making processes uh, to these systems. So with that, um, I think I'll end. Hopefully there's time for questions. I know that was a really quick overview, uh, but I was very limited on time. So thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, we do have a few minutes for questions. Um, while I'm waiting for questions to come into the chat, I actually have a question for you. Yeah. So you showed us uh, pictures of different rain gauges and weather stations. If I'm going shopping for like a fairly basic rain gauge, 
are there any differences in the design types or things I should be thinking about if I'm picking out a rain gauge for home? Uh, I think in the home setting, it you don't have to be really precise. It's to give you a sense of how much rain fell. Like, uh, you know, 1.1 inches versus 1.2 inches isn't going to make um, a huge difference. I think one thing you do want to consider is uh, make sure you get a model that doesn't allow evaporation quickly. Because if you get a rainstorm in the morning, for example, and you don't come home for four or five hours, a certain amount of that water might evaporate out of your, your rain gauge. So like um, maybe the one in the middle might be slightly better than the one um, elsewhere, but it's you have to make that decision on a case by case basis. Great, thank you. Any other questions? All right. So thorough, Dan. Sorry, what was that, Joellen? I, I said that Dan was so thorough. Yes. Yes. Um, there is there I think the question is about whether the website has a great rain gauge. Maybe um maybe I the question might be about what types of um rain gauges or weather stations are used for the NUA forecasting. Um, if you could put that information in the chat and we could transition into Joellen's talk, will that work? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Um, or if I didn't get the question right, um, please feel free to clarify in the chat as well. Um, all right, so our IPM Minute presenter today is Joellen Lampin. Um, and Joellen, you can go ahead and start sharing your screen. I think I have given you the correct permissions. So Joellen is an IPM su support specialist with the New York State IPM program. She's also our lawn IPM expert and tick expert. But today she's going to be talking about lawns and specifically mowing. So thanks for joining us, Joellen. You are very welcome. So I only have a few minutes, so let's just get going with that. So how's it growing out there? Uh, this is how grass grows over the course of, of the year. And here we are uh, right at the beginning of June and we are at peak grass growing season. So what does this mean for what you're going to do um, with your mowing, which is the most important thing that you can do to provide yourself with really good grass. We really focused on mowing right, feeding right, and watering right. Today I'm talking about mowing. So when we're thinking about grass, we want to think of what's going on above the ground and what we actually see um, and apply that to what's going on below the ground. So when we're managing grass, we really want to really focus on making sure that we're building robust root systems. So the more green that we have on top of the ground, collecting um, sunlight and uh, doing a photosynthesis thing, the more dense, the deeper the root systems are, which is going to allow it to be able to overcome different pests and diseases and drought conditions. So uh, you can believe your own eyes. So here side by side, we have grass that was grown at four inches compared to grass that was uh, mowed at only two inches uh, right next to each other. That four inch grass is that deep green color that we really love to see compared to that kind of lime green that is in a two inch uh, mark. And that is actually crabgrass, which nobody wants. Um, it's an annual, so it's going to die at first frost. So we really wanna have that, that darker green color. Uh, what this also gives us is that uh, the higher the grass is, the slower it grows and the less often you need to mow it. So that four inch grass was only mowed once a month as compared to the shorter grass that needed to be mowed weekly to keep it at that two inches. And um, so our recommendation is to set your mower at the highest possible uh, setting that it has, which is also going to delay the amount of time uh, that you need to mow. 
um, between those different events. So we're going to save not only your grass being nice and healthy and creating root, great root systems, but we're going to save you some time and fuel. And we always want to stick to that one third rule. Um, this is a chart that was given to me by Carl Trementi out of the turf grass team at Cornell University. And it's showing that as we go from March to June, the grass is just growing more and more as we would expect from that first slide. But he also compared grass that was being mowed at two inches uh, compared to uh, grass that was being mowed at three inches. And you can see that the two inch grass is actually growing faster than um, the three inch cut grass, which means that you need to mow it more often to not get that um, more than one third cut off at a time. If you cut off more than a third, it's really gonna stress out the plant. It's gonna pull reserves from the root systems uh, as we go into the more stressful, hot and drier summer. One thing I just wanna really mention quickly is that there's this huge thing about no mow May, which is the idea to create pollinator resources. So there's gonna be more things that are flowering in it. I asked my colleagues to send me pictures of their no-mo areas. And the one thing that I want you to notice is that here we are at the end of May, those tall grass areas don't have flowers in them. Um, and we saw this pretty consistently across the state. In my own yard, where are the flowers? They're in the mode part of my yard. So um, our recommendation, what's gonna be good for pollinators, it's gonna be good for your lawn, is to mow high in May, June, and July. And just one last thing, you want to keep those blades sharp. You should sharpen your blades after 10 to 12 hours of use uh, for a uh, quarter acre lawn. The estimate is that's gonna take about 30 minutes. Um, so the, the higher your cut, the less often you're gonna need to sharpen your blades. So if you are, um, mowing at three inches, you might need to do it twice during the season. If it's four inches, you probably only need to get those blades sharpened um, once a year. So give your lawn the edge, give yourself a break. You're gonna mow high, you're gonna mow often enough to remove only a third of the leaf blade and you're gonna keep those blades sharp. Um, in the chat, we did, I'm not sure if they got in there, we have uh, a resource called, uh, an, lawns and an environmental asset and it's going to provide you information on how to maintain a healthy lawn and the second um, link is going to bring you directly to a page that has videos on how to sharpen those mower blades. Thank you. Thanks Joellen. Um, if there are any questions you can go ahead and put them in the chat. I'm seeing a comment so far about um, not knowing if uh, this person's lawn service will sharpen the mower blades or not. Um, I'm assuming perhaps on the equipment that they use um, or whether they mow high. Um, and I don't know, it would probably depend on the lawn service how responsive they would be to that request, since it would mean they would be mowing less. Well, and it, they should be mowing or they should be sharpening their blades after 10 uh, hours, which means that they're going to need to do it every three days depending on how many yards they're servicing so that is definitely a question that you can ask and you can see ask them how often do you sharpen your blades because you know that that's going to lead to healthier turf grass yes all right so adjusting height yeah that's a whole other thing if they're going to change that from customer to customer um it depends on the machine how easy that is you can always ask and if they say no then you can always look for another company and perhaps the more of us who ask the uh, more popular it will be for them to mow higher that would be great that's great all right, so we are getting right up on 1230, um, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, the recording for today's presentations will be up on YouTube. It might take a week or so um, until we can correct the captions um, so that they're available for folks who need them. 
Our next What's Bugging You First Friday event is July 1st, and we'll be talking about identifying common garden tomato diseases and also avoiding squash vine borer. So those are two topics that I know are near and dear to the hearts of many gardeners, myself included. Um, a special bonus for July's first Friday event, we're actually going to have two sets of presentations. If you join us at noon, you can hear these two presentations in English. If you join us at 1230, you can hear these presentations in Spanish. So um, please share this information with um, others who might be interested um, in registering for July's event or for other events that are coming up. And don't forget to submit your photos for our IPMNU photo contest. Thanks for joining us and have a great day.